in Orlando, Florida, a small two-year-old child is snatched by an alligator from the edge of a lagoon. His father could do nothing to stop it. A week earlier, an up-and-coming 22-year-old singer named Christina Grimmie is shot dead while signing autographs after a show. And of course, just last week, a mass shooting, a cold-blooded massacre at the Pledge nightclub. One city, in one state, in one country, in our vast world. And the skeptics ask, where was your God in all of this? Just outside Harrow, on a straight, level road, a 23-year-old man just finished college, just gaining traction in a life scarcely begun, is killed in a violent car crash. On a street here in town, while crossing in a crosswalk, Two elderly sisters are struck by a car. One dies, one survives. One town, in one province, in one country, in our vast world. And the skeptics ask, where was your God in all of this? Be still, my soul, for God is on your side. The families of the victims, the families of all the loved ones lost, may well ask the same question. Where was God in all this? Nicholas Walterstorff. In his book, Lament for a Son, gives a heart-wrenching account of his struggle to come to terms with the death of his 25-year-old son, Eric, in a climbing accident. In many ways, it is a psalm of lament, just like our responsive psalms 42 and 43 that Jane just read. His is the honest wrestling of a faithful person who experiences such heart-sickening grief in which God's absence is so deeply felt. And yet, his thirst for hope remains. Walter Storff writes, Faith is a footbridge that you don't know will hold you up over the chasm until you're forced to walk out onto it. Am I deluded in believing that in God the question shouted out by the wounds of the world has its answer? Am I deluded in believing that someday I will have the answer? Still, he goes on to say, I cannot do anything else than place my hope in God, the creating one, the resurrecting one. What Walter Storff wrote in 1987 is basically the same message the psalmist gave thousands of years before. 
The genius of the Psalms lies in the fact that they're both inspirational and instructional. They speak both to the heart and to the mind. The Psalms say things that we would like to say. Taken as a pair, Psalms 42 and 43 speak to our fear of being abandoned by God. And that's a very real fear, isn't it? It's our question, where was God? in all of this. And we're filled with the hunger and the hope that it not be so. That indeed God has not abandoned us. The graphic images that the psalmist uses of hunger and thirst, I think they described aptly the human condition. Hunger and thirst. What better image, I ask you, than hunger for spiritual abandonment? What better image than thirst for spiritual despair? And yet at the same time, the psalmist sets aside all the images and asks the very real question that not only skeptics, but also believers ask when faced with tragedy and despair, where was God in all of this? I think the psalmist knows us well. And what does he do? He encourages both the skeptic and the believer to go to church. For in his view, that is where one can join the throng, quote, in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of thanksgiving a multitude-keeping festival. I think the psalmist knows the power of liturgy in facing despair. Be still, my soul, for God is Many of us are in church today because years ago we were expected and sometimes required to go. And truth be known, on our own we probably wouldn't have chosen to go. But when we became older, some of us returned some of us stopped going altogether. But for us here, we came to acknowledge our thirst. Whether there were gaps in our Sunday attendance or not. We suffered troubles and we experienced pain in our lives. And we began to seek a reasonable answer to the question, where is God in all of this? Only to discover in the end, mystery. Mystery, but at the same time, a faith that holds us tight. That tells us that God is with us always in our joys, and in our pain. Today there are men and women in church pews, 
in pulpits and in theological seminaries who were led to the water reluctantly. They were led there perhaps by friends, by family members, or by colleagues. I prefer to think they were led there by God. But through it all, they discovered that they liked it. That is the power of liturgy. That is the power of the water. That's the power of God. That's the power of God in the church. The power to infuse our spirits with hope and a sense of calm during times of despair. The danger for so many people today, as Simone Weil points out, not lest the soul should doubt whether there is any bread, but lest by a lie, it should persuade itself that it is not hungry. The metaphors of hunger and thirst roundly emphasize the human need for God. I can't say that enough. Long ago, the prophet Isaiah asked, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? When Jesus encountered the woman at the well who asked him for a drink, he said, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water I will give them will never be thirsty. But really, in my view, in my humble view, it's the psalmist who expresses our universal need for God best. When in essence he writes, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for you. Can we sing about that? Let's sing now the essence of Psalm 42, as found on page 766 in Voices United, as the deer pants for the water. 